G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We've got a massive show for you this week. We're going to talk about some habits that drive us all mad. We're going to be talking about the brand new Polestar 2 and we're going to answer some of your questions. But to help us get through all of that, we've brought in the guy that can reach the top shelf when none of us can, <laughs> Scott Colley. <laughs> Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me again. And I'm looking forward to getting some stuff off my chest when we when we start talking about driver habits. Yeah, and if we could just, I need a glass, it's up in the top cabinet, that'd be really helpful, thank you. Camera's rolling, not now. Oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, and to help us get through uh, Scott, because half an hour of just Scott talking might be a little too much for anybody, <laughs> we've brought in someone who's about to be the master of driving a manual car, Jade Credentino. Welcome back, Jade. Nothing in that sentence was accurate, but we'll just keep rolling. <laughs> we'll see. Well, when, we're, when, when you're back on the podcast again, we're going to report back about how your manual, your first manual driving experience went. So. Yeah, my heart's currently racing. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's swiftly move along. Let's get straight into it. Uh, Vic Police actually did something recently that I can actually get behind and support, which is it's about damn time. Oh, isn't it? Yeah, they've started booking people for hogging the right lane or the fast lane, depending on where in the world you live. Now, now, in Victoria and most states in Australia, if you're on a road that is multi-lane and above 80 kilometres an hour, you, can, you, you have to keep left and less overtaking. Uh, in Victoria, if you spend more than a kilometre in the fast lane on a road above 80 kilometres an hour, you can actually be fined and uh, handed some demerit points, which nobody really wants. It's not a small fine either. It's $190-odd, something like that, yeah. which is a pretty fair whack. That's enough to ruin your holiday. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Jade, uh, I'm curious, as you recently moved from New South Wales, is this a habit that you saw a lot in New South Wales as well, or is it a Victorian thing? Um, look, I think that, because they're obviously very side-by-side, side, um, most of the drivers will mimic the other side. So yeah, I think it's definitely on freeways. I didn't even know this rule existed. To me, it's common sense, but I didn't think it was actually in writing. So just to be clear, are you saying you've never sat in the right lane and hogged it before? Look, Scott, we had this conversation before. I wasn't going to publicly admit it, but yes, <laughs> here I am on the record. I'm guilty. Don't charge me. Um, I think we're all guilty of it. At it, some it's very point, easy to do if you're not concentrating. But I think the thing that is, is really aggravating is when you're on a busy road, say you're on an uh, uh, inner city freeway where it's like four lanes wide, or even on a rural highway like the Hume Highway, you come up behind someone and they just don't move, they don't overtake, they do what they call the Victorian shuffle. Like that, it's incredibly aggravating. It does feel like there's an element in Victoria, especially of people trying to do the police's job. There's this thing of, well, I'm doing 110. So if you're going faster than me, you're speeding and you shouldn't be. Um, there's almost indignance from the drivers who are in front. And yeah, on a four lane road, it's not too bad because I know you're not meant to, but if someone is determined to stay there, you can go around them. But on somewhere like the Hume, if there's a truck in the left lane and someone in the right lane just yeah. determined to not move, what are you meant to do? It's one of those things that it's good that the police are cracking down on it because, you know, as we, if we all live in Victoria and it is tyrannical, the speeding, <laughs> the speeding enforcement down here, so it's good that they're looking at something else. But uh, I think it brings up a bigger point, um, and I know you and I both actually wrote op-eds about it recently, that driver distraction is probably one of the key elements at play here. Now, all of these cars, most cars have come out since, I don't know, that's... 2000, 2003, have a form of cruise control. But uh, do you think people aren't using it, Jade? What do you reckon? Um, this is actually funny, and if my mum listens to this, I am going to get in very big trouble. But she <laughs> bought a Hyundai Accent in 2013, and it was a base model, and it doesn't have cruise control. And every time I take her in a car with cruise control, she thinks it's the best bloody thing that's ever <laughs> existed. So I think... A lot more cars now as of, I think it was 2018 or 2019, where it started to become a standard feature and adaptive cruise control. You kind of will get in the higher trim levels. I think a lot of people are still being introduced to the technology and are not confident with it. Like I know I get a phone call from my mom and she drives a brand new i30 for work. She'd be like, Jade, I just used the cruise control. <laughs> and she's like, did you know it like slows down and speeds up for you? And I'm like, oh no, like there's people like that out there. God bless her. But I think it's definitely something that people might not use. And there's a lot of people who would still not want to rely on that technology. I think as the new generation kind of comes through and that technology is what they've grown up with and what they use from the get-go, then yeah, definitely. I think there is a thing with the stop-start. Um, I think if the person in front of you slows down, if you're not paying attention to your speed based on using the cruise control, 
it, it's very easy to fall into that right lane habit. So yeah, I don't know, have you guys ever done that? Adaptive cruise is a bit of a dangerous one. Well, yeah. yeah, back in the day when you didn't have the automatic radar on it, if you were going faster than the car in front, you'd just yes. come up behind them. And if they're doing what they should be in checking their mirrors, they'd realise they're slow and get out of the way. Whereas now you might have the cruise set to 115. Not that I would ever set the cruise over well, the speed there's, limit. Well, there's, there's, you know, depending, you might be in the Northern depending Territory. The right, yeah, good, there yeah. is that. Um, but yeah, if you come up behind someone, you're going faster, the car slows down and maintains a gap and either you don't notice or the car in front doesn't until you override it. So I do think that's part of it as well. And I suppose at the core of all of it, it's just paying attention to what's going on around you. Yeah, which yeah. is a big, I think that's a big problem on Australian roads that Australians are very, um, we're a relaxed people and it, it can become easy. Like you're sitting on a road, especially in Victoria where a lot of the speed limits are probably lower than they should be. Mm. It's very easy to become distracted. I've been guilty of fiddling with the radio or looking out the window and then suddenly I realise that I'm like going slower than the speed limit or whatever it might be. Um, but there was a recent study, Jade, that, that I know you managed to dig up some information yes. on about uh, Australians and the, or Victorians and their mobile phone use in a car, which this is, is terrifying. This is very and really scary, scary numbers. Yeah. Uh, so I would hope that this was done anonymously because uh, the Transport Accident Commission uh, surveyed 2,403 drivers in Victoria and 52% of them still admitted to holding their mobile phone or using it behind the wheel. So this excludes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. This sounds Scott. like one of those things the police do to catch felons yes. where they go, you've won a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> and then people self-report and get fined yeah. for it. Well, this is what I mean. I don't, anyway, I, I don't know. A couple of the top line stats is that 45% of these drivers will admit to using an app while driving. So it might be Spotify, um, YouTube. <laughs> yes, that was, that was actually, that was it could listed, be a possibility. Yeah. In your day, you just um, wind down the window and yell. Yeah. <laughs> I love how you do it. 25% um, said that they admit to writing a text message um, and 26% admitted to actually picking up the phone and having a phone call while driving. Um, an interesting stat that I found is that 63% of these drivers are aged between 18 to 39 years. That's not a huge surprise though because we are the tech generation, right? I agree, but I find that with new cars now, drivers who are open to getting a brand new car or a car, let's say circa, you know, 2018, they have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Are these drivers still using that technology and still using their phones? Like, well, I know I've I been guilty of it once I think it's worth jumping in there twice. and saying, though, that based on, and this is not the most up-to-date data, it was a couple of years ago, but the average car on Aussie roads is 12 or 13 years old, yeah. which is before Apple CarPlay, and the younger people, especially given new cars are so expensive, mm -hmm they're probably the least likely to be able to afford something with CarPlay. So yeah. I do see what you're saying there, but I think if we're talking about that demographic, they're the ones that might not have the disposable income to spend on a new car, one with CarPlay and that sort of thing. And maybe that's a part of it. Yeah. So, I think yeah. also, and we're do, just hooked on our phones. Please, please do leave a comment and let us know. If you are between the ages of 18 and 39 and your car has CarPlay, do you use it to send messages, to answer phone calls? Um, if you're going to admit to using a phone while driving, please do not use your real name or do and we'll pass yeah. the information. Can we have your license number, phones. registration yeah. <laughs> yeah. and state? Sean has a friend yes. in the police who'd really yes. like to know. <laughs> yes, yes, I've now made friends with Vic Police since I started <laughs> walking people for the right lane. So yes, aside from playing with a phone, which look, I'm sure we've all been guilty of glancing down at the phone and seeing who's messaged us at one point or another at a traffic light, mm -hmm. but is there uh, any other habits that absolutely drive you mad on the road? You have one, but I've it's not on the road, it's actually on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I'm jumping ahead here, but I noticed before you said New South Wales, not it. New South Wales. That's how you say it. Interesting. Uh, okay. Look, coming from New South Wales, I think that's incorrect. I think there was also a cough in the background from our grammar <laughs> checker who's just... <laughs> pulled up a false on Sean's claim. Yeah, uh, surprisingly, Paul is sitting over there and surprisingly he hasn't got his face on camera yet. It's a matter of time. Um, yes, um, cows in New South Wales make a different yes, noise. Yes, I think a lot of the listeners now are probably having that conversation with themselves internally. So probably. I think they're all going to side with me, just for the record. But yes, probably, New but, uh, South Wales. It's my show. so It's uh, a brand yeah. new car. Yeah, it's a brand new car. Brand yes. new car. Brand um, new car. <laughs> aside from your habit of saying new, uh, high beam. It does feel to me, having spent a bit of time driving in the country recently, like people are pretty lazy with that. And I think auto high beam's probably part of the problem. Yeah. Modern headlights are also really bright, which mm -hmm. maybe means that these people aren't on high beam, but it feels like they are. But, you know, when you're coming over a crest and you can see there's another car coming, dipping your headlights before that rather than waiting until they're blind, yeah. 
that for me is a really big one at the moment. Mm. So let us know what your frustrations are on the road. Leave us a comment on YouTube or write to us at podcast at carexpert.com.au and tell us what the most frustrating thing you have to deal with on the road is. Uh, but don't we'll, do it while you're driving. Don't do it while you're driving. Yes, and please. don't look at your phone yes. while you're driving. Pull yep. over and then uh, send, send the message or wait until you finish uh, your trip whilst listening to this fantastic podcast and then send us an email with that. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll move on. We'll keep it all rolling. Um, uh, Polestar, if you haven't heard of Polestar, they're an offshoot of Volvo. They used to make really cool, fast versions of Volvos, but in recent years, they've decided to change it up a little bit and actually become their own sort of standalone brand. And they've recently, uh, well, they've basically just moved into making EVs and some pretty cool EVs as well. The Polestar 3 has been in Australia for a little while now. The Polestar 2 has also been here for a little while. Well, Polestar 2 is here. Polestar 3 will be here next year. Copy. It's a big so, SUV. Bad, there, there's a lot yeah. and they're confusing. Well, the names don't make any so sense. So I'm glad you made the mistake because I was yeah. going to make it too. So. The 1 was their first. Okay, yeah. this makes a lot of sense actually. The 1 was their first car. The 2 was their second. The 3 was their third. But there's no logic to the numbers and the size of the car. Yes. The 3 is That's bigger than I the 4. Confused. But the four is bigger than the two, so. Well, let's rewind. Okay, so the Polestar 2 has been in Australia for a little while now. The Polestar 3 is not that far away. But the Polestar 2 recently got a bit of a midlife update. Although, Scott, uh, I think you found that it's not really just the new bumper they put on it. Yeah, so sometimes these midlife updates are really subtle. You know, we have car brands come to us, and I know at one point Mitsubishi said, we've moved the seatbelt warning light. Yeah. Um, but Polestar has made the front-wheel drive Polestar 2 rear-wheel drive, and this is part of a broader shift within the Volvo Geely group. The Volvo XC40 is also going rear-wheel drive. It Which is what the, yeah, so this yeah. car is based on that, isn't it? It is, and there's bigger batteries, there's more power. It's a really significant change, and it really feels like it from behind the wheel. So a couple of specs uh, to, to wrap your head around. You get essentially two versions uh, of motors. You get a single motor, which is about 220 kilowatts, and you get a dual motor version, which is about 310 kilowatts. Uh, the single version is obviously the one that is now become rear-wheel yeah. drive. Um, you can also get a performance pack, which makes it like a... Yeah, so oh, 350 kilowatts from the performance pack. It used to be a power upgrade option. They've now made it standard. That is the most expensive model in the range, though, and I actually don't know if it's one you'd buy. Yeah, so the, yeah, um, they start at about $67,000 for the entry-level single motor, yeah. which is probably pretty reasonable for the car. No, you don't think? Uh, I'll let you go the, first because I've got the, some thoughts on this too. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I test drove a Polestar when they first came to Sydney. This is like two, nearly two years ago. I would not be paying $68,000 for that. Plus on roads, I'm assuming. Like, yeah. no way. I mean, there's, like, there's a lot of rebates and stuff you can get. Uh, not well, in not Victoria, for long. But yeah. yeah and well, New South you know, Wales is taking South them away as well exactly. based on recent comments. Yeah, so. look, I think if I was to get an EV and I had 70 grand, would I be putting my investment in a Polestar? Probably not. I find that really interesting because, I mean, for one, you say 70 grand and that is what you actually should pay for a Polestar because all of them have a three and a half thousand dollar option for the pilot pack. Mm -hmm. And even though this is a brand that's safety focused, it's high tech, the car looks fantastic, you have to pay for adaptive cruise control. It's part of that pilot pack, it's three and a half grand across the whole range. So start looking for these cars in the right lane now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. We'll know whether they paid <laughs> for it. Or they're either out of battery or they're not, <laughs> they didn't yeah. it. Okay. But I do think that of all of the sort of new electric car brands, Polestar is one of the most interesting. Uh, Tesla obviously is really, really common in Australia now. The Model 3 and the Model Y are constantly among the best sellers. Yep. The Polestar is selling strongly relative to some other electric cars, but it's still a bit of an unknown thing. And although there are definitely parts of it that don't feel all that expensive, I mean, the interior is very sort of stripped back, but there's some cheaper materials there. I think it looks fantastic, and I think of all the electric cars I've driven, it's one of the ones that gets the most questions. Those um, have a pretty good range, right? Like all of the, like the long range is about 650 k's, but even the single motor is in the 500s in, in terms of range, isn't it? Theoretically. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, all of the numbers that manufacturers quote are based on a, a test that's really hard to replicate. But yeah, even in the real world, that rear wheel drive single motor has a really impressive range, and that is one of the things that people look for. I think the other thing that Polestar does really well is it feels modern and high tech, but it doesn't feel kind of threatening in the way that a Tesla can. I know people sit in a Tesla Model 3 and just go, what is going on here? So There's no iPad buttons. and some nothing else. Really. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas the Polestar, you sit in it and you just put it straight and drive to move off, which is quite modern, but the central screen feels really simple to use, but still looks modern. The, the driver display is the same. So it does a good job blending old world and new world. And, I think that's something that a lot of people are still going to be looking for. 
I would love to know if any of our listeners were considering purchasing a Polestar 2. Did you go ahead well, with it? Well, not after your comments. Yeah. But look, I, I am here to be, you know, challenged. I want to know, did they end up buying it or did they consider a, a different car? Definitely let us know in the comments below. And if you do have a Polestar 2, what do you like about it? Mm, Are yeah, you Team good. Scott or Team Jade? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just starting a war now. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. And I think if... The, like you said, the Tesla can be quite daunting for people and especially have never been in, in an EV before, which mm. let's not forget, 99% of the population have never been in an EV. So this is this is new for them. Yeah. So if they're like, uh, but a lot new of people- or? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, new for everyone listening <laughs> at home. Uh, but a lot of people have spent, there's been a lot of Volvos in Australia. Volvo has been here for a long time and there are a lot of XC60s, XC40s yeah, yeah. on the road. So people that are uh, looking to make that shift to EV mm. and they are used to a Volvo or a European car, it's actually not that much of a jump, right? It, it's not a huge leap. And, and I do think that Polestar, although it is building an image of itself as this new sustainable brand, people are aware of the link to Volvo and I think that helps it, to be honest, because if you are going to spend $70,000 on an electric car, you're already making a leap. Knowing that there's some connection to a brand that is you know, renowned for safety, you've probably had one in the family at some point or someone has, it definitely makes that a bit easier. I think the other reason that people might look at the Polestar relative to some of the rivals is, especially after the update, it really drives quite nicely as well. Um, the old one was a little bit rough riding and it also had some torque steer. So when you put your foot down, the wheel sort of tugs in your hands like an old hot hatch. The downside of a front wheel drive, like right. a huge amount of instant torque through a front wheel drive, right? Yeah, whereas the new one is rear drive. It rides a little bit differently. Polestar says there's no changes to the hardware, but definitely feels like it because well, it's much more Well, they put the drive relaxed. to the fact there's definitely changes to the hardware. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm nah, sorry. Nah, <laughs> they, just, they just flip the cabin around. Yeah, they turn it over. <laughs> um, but it also, it, it's quicker in a straight line, it's more efficient, and we drove it on some twisty roads. It's pretty good fun too. You can really tip it into a corner and then put it into sport mode and it does little electric car drifts. So one thing I know, uh, Scott, actually, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put the vision up now. Uh, Scott found a really cool little feature inside the Pulsar 2's infotainment, didn't you? Yeah, so it's built on Android Automotive, which is Google software, and as part of an over-the-air update, they've added YouTube to it. So. When you're sitting still at a charger for a little while, you can watch car expert videos on the go and just never be without Paul and Sean. So if you're sitting in your Polestar 2, charging it and watching this video right now, leave a comment down below, we'd love to know that. Uh, make sure that you are still at the charging bay when you pick up your phone. Right I tested there. this actually. Um, I was on a driveway, not on the public road, but if you are watching YouTube and you put the car in drive, it immediately turns off. That's, yeah, that, I, Which I would expect sense. that from Volvo. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Does it feel safe? Like, like you drive a lot of uh, the big Volvo SUVs and they do feel really solid and safe. Well, yeah, this, I mean, the Polestar is not a massive car. It's got, one of the problems with it actually is that it's quite small inside, but it still weighs around two tonnes and it feels really rock solid on the highway. Um, it, it definitely has Volvo DNA to it, but I do also think having driven the XC40 electric, which is closely related, it feels a little bit sportier, but yeah, rock solid and quite enjoyable to drive. Where do you stand on it, Jade? Oh, I'm definitely keen to see the larger or smaller Polestar 3, still Larger. confused. Larger. Because yeah. <laughs> um, is that built on a Volvo platform? Yeah, sort of. It's a version of the EX90 platform, right. I believe, and then the 4 is a different one again. It's a Geely, which is the Chinese that, that's brand. That's what I mean. I would finally them. like to see Polestar have a fully manufactured Polestar mm. product. I think it's great that they're using the brand loyalty from Volvo. I think it's a very smart marketing move, and I think it would definitely attract buyers that were looking to move to electric um, and still stay within the Volvo kind of Geely Group family. Would I buy one? I want some more time to think about it. Um, I'm at a no, but after Scott kind of rattling off some stuff, I think I want to test drive the new one before I make my final decision. So for 70 grand, looking at EV, where would you, where would you lie at the moment? Look, I think Tesla. And it's not because everybody does it. I know, but I think it's, to me, it's safe. I know it's going to work. I know it's got 99% of the technology that I look for in a vehicle. And I know what to expect from mechanical faults or, you know, things over the air updates, everything like that. Everyone seems to know about Tesla. Whereas when you're looking at Anything other brands- Anything happen at any point and who knows? Yes. Exactly. Yes. But everyone <laughs> on Twitter will know about it, everything. I think when it comes- Sorry, it's called X, X just yes. to be very yeah. specific. Yeah. Sorry, Elon. Uh, 
the new Twitter yes. is called X. Yep. <laughs> it's, a um, it's a facelift in Twitter, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm still a little bit apprehensive about going with a legacy brand that has just moved to EVs. I think it it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. What about you, Scott? Your money, like 70 grand EV, would you be in the Polestar? Would you go the Tesla? Where, where do you think? Uh, I'm going to caveat this with the fact that this suits me really well, but is not the most practical decision. I actually prefer driving the Polestar. It definitely, it has a worse back seat and boot than the Tesla. There's limited storage up front, but I really enjoy driving it. I really enjoy the way it looks. And with the switch to rear drive, I'd very happily have the long range single motor. Mm. And I think it'd suit me really nicely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, what would you what would you guys buy? Let us know. Uh, does Polestar interest you? Would you want to stick with Tesla? Uh, which, by the way, let me just point out, Tesla doesn't have Apple CarPlay, so uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. Jade, you might have to uh, how much rethink was that? your strategy. Fine, on that one. Yeah, there was a mobile phone <laughs> find somewhere it? up yeah. here. Yeah. Um, mm. Let us know. But if you're considering a Polestar two or a Tesla, did you know we have a great Fantastic tool on our website called Help Me Car Expert. We I didn't, did. Sean. Tell me more. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if you uh, sign up in the next note. Uh, we, we, we spoke to our friends at CarWow and we sort of pinched their idea. Uh, so head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert. You'll land on a web page with lots of photos of Paul and he can help you find the best deal, connect with the dealer and get you behind the wheel of a new Polestar, a new Tesla or maybe even a uh, Ram 1500. Oh, can wow, I ask you a question deal. about this page? Yeah, sure. So there's a photo there with Paul and he's holding a magnifying glass. Yes. And even if you're not looking for a new car, head to the page to see this photo. Car expert. Is he burning an ant underneath there? <laughs> is he trying to read the like Declaration of Independence? <laughs> What's going on with that? He is... Uh, I really have no answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, probably himself, it was one, yeah. of Paul's, one of Paul's many ideas. Okay. He, wanted, he likes doing poses, so... That's, so, oh, he says he speaks. He, he, he speaks, but I'm not going to repeat what he said, <laughs> yes. uh, just in case. <laughs> Off the record. But yes, head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and we'll hopefully be able to help you find a good deal. If you do use Help Me Car Expert, leave us a comment or write to us podcast at carexpert.com.au and let us know how the, how the service was, how it all worked, and what car you bought. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on to your questions. It's time. Uh, it's the first time we're doing this on the podcast. It's kind of an exciting moment. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll dive straight in, and I think this is... This is kind of a, an interesting one. I know there's going to be some conjecture from you guys about this one. Uh, so Derek on Instagram asks, what is a properly affordable large family car, not some 90K SUV? Does it exist? Okay, can I just preface this you with... quick on that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, quick. Hold <laughs> on. You're waiting. Bing, Jade. Um, with what is affordable to you? And, and hold on, I'm going to preface this. Everyone listening at home, none of us have children, families. I think there's a really big... Um, Members of the car expert team do, but yes. we specifically don't. Yeah, yeah, I want to know individually, what do we kind of deem affordable? I know I have my nannying hat on with family, so I want to obviously speak for those people, but... What, what do you guys deem affordable? I think a few years ago, Ben, I used to work in sort of car dealer land. Mm. Um, this is like sort of mid noughties. Mm. The average family car would cost around $60,000. So that's assuming yeah. mum and dad and let's say two to three kids. Yeah. So I think around 60 is probably a good starting point. Yeah, look, if you're financing a car, which we know a lot of Australians over about $30,000 when it comes to the car do, I would agree with that. I think that, you know, life is expensive at the moment mm. and... It's also, you know, there are people out there who can only maybe spend 30 or 40 grand on a family car. So there's a few options here that'll cover some of those bases, but 60 is definitely, in the context of a big new family car with a full feature set, I think a reasonable marker. All right, so Jade, with that in mind, yep. what would you pick? Uh, everything over 60, no. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong um, voice column. I actually, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I actually did some homework on this because I was really interested. Um, I've got top th four. Um, Let's give it to three. Just no, to yep, but I'm not even gonna. I'm gonna go top two. Um, the reason why. The reason why. Give me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I chose this, I based on it on uh, recommended retail price and also um, ongoing maintenance costs, so servicing and things like that. My top pick was the Honda CRV. It oh, comes okay. five seat, seven seat, and um, it's for your five first services is less than a thousand bucks. Is that still the same for the up the? We are the waiting to hear okay. what the new servicing schedule is going to be and all that type of stuff. It might slightly increase, but just as like a rough idea, if I was to jump to the next most affordable to service, I'm jumping up about a thousand bucks. 
So it's still so by yeah, just a to margin. just clear on that, each of the first five services on the CRV are less than $200. Combined for the five years, it'll cost you less than 1000 bucks. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that would probably be my pick. I'm That's gonna, a solid pick. I'm going to leave question. it at that for now, yeah. drop the mic, walk away. Scott. I've got two. Uh, I've got three, actually. Oh, here um, we go. These numbers are confusing like the Polestar. <laughs> the first is the Mahindra XUV 700. Wow. It's not a massive car. I wouldn't call it a fully large car, but it does have seven seats. It's Australia's most affordable seven-seater. And if that is what you're looking for, it comes with a pretty full feature set. It's not as refined as a CRV, something like that, but it is a lot of seats for the money. Um, you could also look at a Pajero Sport Mitsubishi. If you want to go off-road, you can get a base seven-seat one of those for significantly less than a Ford Everest. Again, you're giving up some tech, but you are getting a lot of car for the money. That's actually a really good pick because I once drove from Brisbane to Darwin mm. in a Pajero Sport, a uh, car full of camera gear. Yeah. Whoa, it that's was, a long it drive. It was really good. Yeah. Like driving those on, on those high-speed 130 kilometres an hour, those outback roads, it was Brilliant. So that's a really, I, I, I like that bit. I'm also a little bit biased. There's a 2005 Pajero in my family and Who I just think that? it's a fantastic car. I <laughs> really, really enjoy that driving. Or did we? <laughs> I did know about that and I should have made the connection. Um, no, 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 the last didn't. one is the Subaru Outback. Uh, it's not a full-size SUV. It's more of a high-riding sort of wagon, but it's got a massive boot, massive back seat. And if you're happy with the 2.5 litre base engine, which is kind of fine, it's not standout, mm. you can get one for just over $40,000, uh, sort of mid 40000 and it's a lot of car for that money. Uh, what would be your pick, Sean? Uh, I'm just going to sound like a Ford Nuffy here, but I think like Everest is yeah. such a good pick. Mm -hmm. You can get in a lower grade one that still has seven seats. It's got oodles of space, got all the tech. Um, and if you if, if off-roading is not really your thing, you just get a 4x2 yep. Yep. version, uh, like a little trend or like the, the ambi ambi ambiente. ambiente. Yes. Another word Sean can't pronounce. Yes, that's because <laughs> I... If it helps, he's not the only one on that <laughs> yes, one. It's, it's quite a trigger. But yeah, I think a, a lower end uh, Everest is probably a really solid pick. Otherwise, yeah, Pad Sport. I think that's a, that's a ripper choice. Uh, are you guys, uh, what are we basing this on? Because I'd love to know in the comments, and obviously guys, reach out to us, email us, what are the big things that people look for when they're looking at a car? Obviously pricing, space. We did ask this question on Instagram. But feature-wise, a lot, uh, Skoda mentioned a couple of months ago um, that a lot of Australians are opting for the top spec models, that's which are more expensive. Australia, yeah. yeah, and so I'm keen to see is... When we say the base model you can get for 40 grand, mm. like, you know, are people even people considering want? that? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I'm really interested to see what uh, are people just completely going past it because it doesn't have the bare minimum of what people look for in a car today. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, do write to us and let us know that. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is uh, kind of an interesting one. Uh, uh, this came to us on YouTube from LG Gaming 2990 uh, and he asked, tell Sounds us why... Like you, Sean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm a Sony person. Uh, <laughs> tell us why MG and GWM can deliver cars quickly, but Toyota needs 12 months. Uh, who wants to take this one? I'm uh, putting it at Scott. <laughs> yeah, okay, Scott. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of answers to this, and it depends on the car and the brand. Um, Toyota has a massive backlog. Uh, it's had factory shutdowns through COVID. There's been semiconductor shortages. Already it was hard to get a RAV4, and we're now at a point where that backlog is so long. Yeah. It's not a matter of just snapping your fingers because ultimately the factory can only build so many. Yeah. Well, I think actually on Toyota they had, uh, they still have backlog yeah, from yeah. the earthquake and the the reactor meltdown from years ago. Like oh, the this is, yeah, back. we're going like, back a long way. It, but it, yeah. it is still a, it's still something that they, yeah. that's that's caused a lot of these problems before COVID even hit, right? Yeah, I mean Toyota is also it's sort of held up as this master of just in time manufacturing. You you know only have what you need and you make it all work really quickly based on a really tight supply chain. But it's been shown up now by the Chinese brands like MG and GWM because they do most stuff in house or they have a really tight supply chain in China around where they're building the cars and that's making it easier. Mm. We've also seen some brands go further again because even once you build the car and get it to Australia, you might get held up by quarantine at the docks. We've had stink bug infestations and that sort of thing. So the likes of MG and I believe BYD are now driving cars straight onto containers and sealing them rather than putting them with other cars and stuff on the container mm -hmm. so that they can't get contaminated on the docks. And, and that's been a big problem they're now trying to get around. So an interesting thing that I know just happened, uh, Ford have actually hired uh, their own Boaty McFord face boat <laughs> to ship Rangers and Everest directly to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, three years for a, a car carrier is a huge investment, but they're going to go back and forward between Australia and Thailand with those Rangers and Everests and... 
they clearly think the demand is there for those cars long term to justify it. Because they were looking at 12 month waits on ranges for a while there, but that's obviously starting to come down, or mm. in theory should come down even more with that boat, right? This just makes me even more excited about the Ford Toyota rivalry and who's going to end up top of the month and top of the year. So I think it, it, it's a very smart move from Ford. I think if they're being if they're able to manufacture quite a large number of vehicles, what is stopping you from getting them here? Solution: get your own boat. So they've done a good job. I think it'll be interesting to see how quickly that delivery or that time delay shortens and, and if that is the actual solution to the problem. Um, but yeah, Ford Ranger, Ford Everest uh, owners are shouting from the rooftops. Two things on that. And I think the first is the new Ford versus Ferrari is a Hilux and a Ranger on the Hume freeway <laughs> side by side. <laughs> um, the 60 k's an hour around Bathurst. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of rubbing mirrors. Yeah. But the other is it shows how reliant Ford is on the Ranger and the Everest in Australia. Yeah. I know the F-150 is arriving and that will help, but it's now cut the Escape, which is in one of Australia's biggest new car segments. Yeah. The Puma is not a huge seller relative to its rivals. And it'll be going electric soon, so I think yeah, it will exactly. potentially drop even more. Mm. The fact for Ford is yeah, willing yeah. to invest in a boat to get these two models of its six or eight car lineup to Australia shows just how desperately it needs them to succeed and how yeah. desperately it needs to start delivering them. Yeah. All right, well, our last question, because we do need to wrap up the podcast. <laughs> you guys probably have some real work to do. Uh, RJ on Instagram asked, manual or automatic transmission? Now, I'm going to add a little bit to this question because I think it's a bit too open-ended. Mm. If you were to look at all the new cars on the market today mm -hmm. and buy one yeah. with the ha that has both options, mm -hmm. would you pick the manual or the auto? First of all, RJ, who paid you to ask this question because it's, uh, yes, they're trying to make me learn manual. I'm going to go manual. I'm going to be, I'm going to try. <laughs> I want to learn it. I think it's fun. I don't know. Every time I'm in the car with the guys and there's a manual that I can't drive, they just seem to have a lot more fun. Maybe it's coincidental um, that I can't drive it and they can. Well, you're, gonna, you're learning in a couple of weeks, aren't you? Ah, uh, yes. Would you yes. like to see that? Uh, leave us a comment and let no, us know. Would you like no, to see Jade not. learning? Um, that's going to be the biggest disaster ever. Um, that's yeah. all right, because we're not using one of our cars. We're going to use a... Yeah, let's uh, not a say that. It's a new Master 2, <laughs> two which it does come in a manual, which is really does, exciting. Yeah. I'm going to go manual. Cool. I'm going to be optimistic until I get that lesson. After that lesson, I'm probably going to switch back. But let's go manual. No, that's great. I think that's a, that's a really cool uh, yep. and good way to look at it. What about you, Scott? Uh, I have, of all the cars I've owned, uh, they've all been manuals. So I'm a little bit biased on this front, but I'm actually going to cheat slightly. If I'm buying a sports car, I want it to be a Honda Civic Type R with a manual. But if I'm driving something to drive to and from work day to day, I'm actually, in my wise old age of, uh, of, of 28, 29, no, I'm 28. Yeah. Numbers are really doing my head in now. Um, I'm going to go automatic because modern automatics are so smooth and so smart. Unless you are driving something for the sake of it, they do a better job anyway. Mm. What about you, Sean? What about you? I drive a manual. That's my, my hold road on, car hold on. is Your car a manual. is a manual. My car is a manual. Yeah. When was the last time when you, did you drove last it? Drive it? <laughs> last, last weekend, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Coincidentally, it doesn't coincide with security footage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was. I drove it last week. Um, if I were to buy uh, another car, I would probably buy a manual. But if I was looking at all of the cars currently on sale in dealerships today, let's say... I had enough money to buy an M2, I'd buy the auto. I, I wouldn't buy the manual. I would buy the auto because if you want the performance, the you can't do what a computer can do. So, you know, it's fun, don't get me wrong, but you're going to spend most of the time just hauling up and down the Monash freeway or driving around. Or if you do go on a, a, a track day, for instance, the, the auto is probably going to be a lot, a much safer option, a much faster option if you're looking for that overall speed. So, yeah, I'd probably... Uh, as much as I love a manual, probably would end up opting for an auto. I want to know, because <laughs> we have seen quite a few cars drop their manual uh, transmission this year. Putting you guys on the spot, what car do you hope will not lose its manual transmission or has lost its manual? Holden Commodore, no. And wish, yeah, <laughs> winner, um, and wish that, you know, it would stay as it is. Uh, Miata, Mazda, M Mazda MX-5, I do hope that that, keeps like those that sort of sports cars i think like the 86 as well uh, slash brz that's, yeah, they, that sort of thing they have to have a manual option i would argue and i think as more manuals disappear from the market 
the, the sort of uniqueness of offering three pedals is only going to get stronger. Mm. We talked about the Mustang a couple of weeks ago on the podcast. Yep. That car is so perfectly suited to a manual. Well, it is because the automatic gearbox is atrocious. It's, well, it's not atrocious, but <laughs> way too many yeah, gears. It's great in a Silverado. It's not so great in a Mustang. Exactly. And that car is an old school muscle car for people who want to relive the glory days. Nothing says that like a really clunky, sort of chunky six-speed manual. I also think we forget in Australia we're very much an automatic nation, yeah. as is the States, but Europe manuals are very popular still. So My I think friends in Europe cannot it. believe that 90%, don't quote me on the 90%, but <laughs> most of our cars are automatic. They just, they're mind blown at the fact that we grow up not learning manual. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Please let us know, manual or automatic. Uh, and if you were to go out and buy a car today, would you pick the auto version or the manual version? Let us know. Uh, I think we'll wrap that up. We'll leave it there for this week. Please keep sending in questions because I think this is That fun. was fun. Yeah, I, I think we should pick it. Yeah. it. We did a very spontaneous yeah. Q&A on Instagram. So if you're not following us already on Instagram, head over to carexpert.com.au on Instagram and make sure you hit the follow button. And also on Facebook, we may or may not chuck something up on there every so often. So make sure you're following us over on there. That's carexpert.com.au as well. So write to us, let us know what you think. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. If you're on YouTube, uh, leave us a comment. Make sure you like and subscribe. If you are listening, head over to YouTube and check it out because you get to see our faces and it's probably a little more fun, but only if you're not driving. Do not or watch YouTube while two, driving. Or if you're charging, charging your Polestar 2. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. giving people so many instructions yeah, now. Yes. It's very, okay, let's just, let's just summarize really quickly. If you're driving, don't touch your phone. Correct. Wait. It, take and away. stay on the yes. right lane. Key yeah. take away. Yes. 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 And don't dip your high beams. Your yes. <laughs> Okay, so this yeah, is... Hold on, let's just add a few more things. Yeah, so we, no, yeah. let's not, let's not. So leave us a comment, <laughs> let us know what's the most uh, annoying driver habit that you can <laughs> you get. Uh, would you buy a Polestar 2? And uh, would you have an automatic or manual car? Leave us a comment and let us know. But guys, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been, <laughs> it's been a lot. the longest outro. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been a lot, but we're, it we're, we're, we're nearly there. We're thanks, nearly Sean. There. It's been good fun. Yeah, thanks for coming, Scott. Jade, thanks for coming back again. I don't have as much homework this week, so I'm actually yeah. quite happy with the output you guys have contributed. <laughs> thank you. That's all right. Well, maybe we'll, we'll give some Jade some more homework. So keep sending in your questions. Let us know. <laughs> it's getting longer. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just Okay, bye guys. <laughs> okay, we'll see you next week. <laughs>